Hi friends, I am Srishti Jain and today we are going to start 5 questions of finance. Today the questions are really interesting and they relate to the factors affecting inflation. Then we have the capital formation. Then we have a question on degree of financial leverage and kinds of capital structure theories. Then we have a very interesting topic related to finance that is rule of 72. And lastly we have a question on securities and bonds. So do watch the video till end to understand all the concepts in detail. If you like my video then do subscribe to our channel for more regular updates. Now starting with the first question for today. The question says that inflation is the rate at which the general price level of goods and services rises. Which of the following factors do not contribute to a rise in inflation? So now first let's understand that what are the factors that affect inflation and then we'll come back to the options to understand that what is the answer. Now I have bifurcated the factors into two heads that is related to goods and related to money. So firstly let's discuss about the goods. Now we all know that the prices of a good is determined by using the demand and supply. So the first point says that supply of goods goes down and that is also known as the cost push inflation. So because of the supply of goods going down the inflation is rising and how it is happening? Suppose supply of the goods are going down and why is this? Because the raw materials which are used to manufacture the products their prices have increased. So as a result the cost of production will increase and when the cost of production increases the prices of the goods in general will rise and that will lead to the inflation because we know that inflation is the rise in the general price level of goods. Now we have the demand for goods goes up. Now that is also known as the demand pull inflation. Suppose you have more money now. So more money is chasing fewer goods in the economy. So as a result the demand is going up here but the supply is constant and as a result when demand goes up the prices will also go up. Now do not confuse this with the law of demand because that is one way. That says that the prices and demand are inversely related. But I am talking when the demand is going up the prices will also go up. As you can see when you start to demand more of some good the producers think that the product can be sold at a higher price. So the prices will also go up and hence when the prices goes up inflation as a result will also go up. So I hope that these two points are clear to you. In both these points that is the cost push inflation and demand pull inflation the inflation is rising. Now let's move to the other segment of this that is the money factors. Now here what is happening is it says when the supply of money goes up. So when the money supply goes up that means that people have more money and when people is having more money that is chasing the fewer goods as we have seen here. Now the supply of money is at a rise, people have more money, they will spend more, circulation of money will be more, velocity of money will be more and as a result inflation will rise. Now let's move on to the next one that is when the demand of money goes down. So see what does demand of money means. So it means the desired holding of financial assets in the form of money that is cash or bank deposits. So when your demand for money has gone down that means that you will try to invest it in some assets, financial assets that is bonds or maybe securities, other securities and why will you try to invest in these securities rather than holding the cash because of the reason that interest rates offered on these securities are more. So let's take this as a factor behind this scenario. So when you are investing, you are transacting more frequently and when you are transacting more frequently, what does that mean? That your transactions are going up. As a result, your velocity is going up. So velocity of money goes up and when the velocity of money goes up that means that you are frequently changing money 
velocity of circulation will go up that is it will change many hands and as a result inflation will rise so i hope that you have understood all these four factors now moving on to the question to answer it so the first option says when the supply of money goes up that is money supply is increasing this is true because it will lead to a rise in inflation second says when supply of goods goes down that is the supply of goods is going down which means that inflation is rising because the price level will go up then we have demand for money goes down so as we have discussed it in the last segment that when the money demand is going down the velocity of money will increase the velocity of circulation will increase and as a result the inflation will rise the next one is the demand for goods goes down so when the demand is going down as a result the prices will also go down and thereby inflation will go down so this is not the reason behind the rise in inflation and hence our answer will be option d now moving on to the next question for today next question says capital formation means increasing the stock of real capital in a country choose the incorrect statement from following with respect to the concept of capital formation so four options have been given to you so before reading on to these options let's first understand that what capital formation means in the next slide so capital formation means more capital goods that is increasing the stock of real capital in a country now three stages have are involved in the creation of savings mobilization of savings and the investment of savings so this is a flow of capital formation that firstly you have to create savings you have to forego some of your present consumption in order to invest in the future then we have the mobilization of savings so what does this mean that through some financial institution that is banks you are mobilizing your savings you are keeping that savings as bank deposits and then your the bank will lend it to some borrower who is ready to invest it so this is how capital formation is there now let's look at the options the first option says the greater the extent to which the people are willing to abstain from present consumption the greater the extent that society will devote resources to new capital formation so this is true the next is an increase in the volume of real savings so that the resources that would have been devoted to the production of consumption goods should be released for the purposes of capital formation so when you are abstaining yourself from the present consumption the resources that would have been devoted to the consumption goods production will now be diverted for the purpose of the capital formation so this point is also true the next is in the process of capital formation savings are mobilized and transferred from the government to the economy so as to increase the money supply in the economy so this is not true because the savings are mobilized from the savers to investors or we say savers to borrowers and not specifically from government to the economy so this is the correct answer the last one says savings should be invested in order to increase capital in the economy which in turn will lead to economic development so when you are saving that will lead to capital formation and as a whole the economy will be developed so economic development is a end result of capital formation so this is also true so our answer is option c now let's move on to the next question for today now the question says degree of financial leverage has an impact on the returns to equity shareholders and on the riskiness of the equity investments affecting the market price of the equity or the value of the firm judicious use of leverage is suggested by which of the following capital structure theories so first let's see that what are these models and what are they talking about in the capital structure theories and then we'll come back to the question so guys the first approach is net income approach and net income approach suggests that the capital structure matters so what does it say that your kd that is the cost of capital for the debentures is constant the cost of capital for the equity shareholders is also constant and 
the cost of capital declines. So the implication is that KD and KE are constant for all levels of leverages that is for all levels of debt financing. So as the debt proportion is increasing the overall cost of capital as I have marked here it is decreasing and as a result the value of the firm will rise. So this capital structure theory does not talk about the judicious use of leverage because in the assumption it says that use of more and more debt financing in the capital structure will not affect the risk perception of the investors. So using of more debt in the capital structure is beneficial for the value of the firm. Now the second one is net operating income approach. The net operating income approach says that the cost of debt is there which is constant and the assumption which we have mentioned in the NI approach that the risk perception of the equity investors will not rise with the increase in the leverage. This is not true here. So as a result when you are using the KD that is the benefit of interest deduction is also there. But this will not decrease the cost of capital the overall cost of capital for the company because it will be offset by the cost of equity because with the use of more debt equity investors will perceive risk and as a result the value of the firm will remain constant and it will not rise with the increased use of debt. So therefore the increase in KE is such as to completely offset the benefits of employing the cheaper debt here. Now the next one is the traditional theory. Now we have discussed two capital structure approaches that is NI and NOI approach and they both hold the extreme views on the relationship between the leverage cost of capital and the value of the firm. Now as per the traditional approach a firm should make a judicious use of both the debt and equity to achieve a capital structure which may be called the optimal capital structure. So at this capital structure the overall cost of capital that is KO of the firm will be minimum and the value of the firm will be maximum. So the diagram is here this is the leverage the cost of capital. So the traditional approach says that the value of the firm increases as we can see here with the increase in financial leverage but up to a certain limit only. Beyond this limit the increase in financial leverage will increase its overall cost of capital and the value of the firm will decline. So see here this is the optimal capital structure I am marking it with O and an arrow. So at this level beyond this level your cost of overall capital is increasing. The risk for the equity investors is also increasing with the increase in the debt and prior to this level your overall cost of capital is decreasing. There is not much effect on the equity shareholders perception on risk with the increase in the use of debt. So traditional approach suggests a judicious use of the leverage. The fourth was the Walters model and that is not a part of capital structure theory but that relates to the dividend decision. So with this I think that we have now got our answer. So our answer is traditional approach. Now moving on to the next question for today. A bird in hand is worth two in the bush gives the correct implication of time value of money. Rule of 72 is a shortcut method to estimate which of the following. So the answer here is compounding effect. Now through an example I will be telling you that how rule of 72 is used in the next slide. Now rule of 72 is a simple way to determine that how long an investment will take to double a given fixed annual rate of interest. So by dividing 72 by the annual rate of return investors obtain a rough estimate of how many years it will take for the initial investment to duplicate itself that is to double itself. For example the rule of 72 states that rupee 1 invested at an annual fixed interest rate of 10% would take approximately 7.2 years to grow to rupees 2. And how the 7.2 years is there? By dividing 72 by the rate of interest that is 10. So it comes out to 7.2. So this is 
a rough estimate of how many years it is taking for rupee 1 to double itself. Now if we have to calculate it using the formula to prove that rule of 72 is genuine and it gives the roundabout estimate of the answer. So let's see. We know the formula future value is equal to the present value into your 1 plus r raised to power n that is CVAF factor. Now your future value you think it should be 2. The present value is 1 and it is 1.1 n. Now solving it by using the log table we get n to be 7.27. So this is the approximate answer over here. So rule of 72 is used for the compounding effect to see that how many years it will take to double the initial investment. Now moving on to the last question for today. A security is a certificate or other financial instrument that has monetary value and can be traded. Gilt edge security is one such type. So which among the following relates to the gilt edge securities? So gilt edge securities are the reliable securities. That is if you invest in them, then there is no risk of default associated with those securities. So the government securities are also known as the gilt edge securities because they are the most reliable securities. As we can see the corporate bonds, zero coupon bonds, deep discount bonds, these are not as reliable as the government securities. So the answer is option A. So with this we have completed our five questions for today. If you have any doubt related to any of the concept then do not hesitate to ask it in the comment section below. If you like my video then do subscribe to our channel for more regular updates. Thank you for watching the video.